I started by introducing myself. My name is Ruth. I'm a junior doctor. I've been helping Lahiru organize um, this like free lecture series with ABCs of anesthesia. So what we're going to be doing is trying to do a lecture every month for the rest of the year on the first Wednesday of every month at this time, 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard. So you can make a note in advance and we'll be covering um, a different topic every month targeted at, you know, that final year medical student level, getting you ready for internship. And so today we've got Nick with us, who's a junior doctor currently working in critical care. And he has prepared this excellent presentation about IV fluids and management. So to make it, try and make it as interactive as possible being online over Zoom, it would be great if people could turn their cameras on if possible um, and feel free to message in the chat as we go. We'll try and keep a track of things and answer as we go. Um, but yeah, I hope, hope you all enjoy and I will hand over to Nick. Great. Nice to meet everyone. So my name is Nick. Um, today I'm going to be talking about IV fluids. And I think it's a really important concept to know going into internship, particularly if you're in fourth year. So a little bit about myself. I'm a critical care resident at Western Health, currently PGA4. I'm interested in pursuing anesthetics in the future. And I enjoy teaching and learning, which is why I'm here today. Um, here are some social media links to the ABCs of Anesthesia resources, so Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'm sure you're all aware, lots of valuable information on there. And some basic assumptions to get us all started. So I want everyone asking lots of questions. I want everyone having a go. I want you to know that I think you're all capable, intelligent, and want to do your best to be the best, and you've shown that by showing up. So it doesn't matter if you get something right. It doesn't matter if you get something wrong. Um, I want to make this a learning opportunity, so just have a crack. So the objectives that I want to take away from this talk is how fluid distributes in the body, how to assess fluid status, how to replace fluids for hospitalized patients, and then how to resuscitate volume deplete patients in hospital. So I want to start off by asking the audience how you might categorize fluids. Has anyone got a framework for that? I'll look for a volunteer, and if I don't, I might just pick someone from the audience. Again, it doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong. We'll, um, we'll go through the process. So, Eloise, Eloise, are you there? Hi, sorry. Um, was there a question, why do we give fluids? No, yeah, so how would you categorize the type of fluids that you give in the hospital? Sorry, I'm sorry, my audio just cut out. Could you repeat that? Yeah, so how would you categorize the type of fluids that you that you give in the hospital? Oh, sure. So um, I don't know a lot, but what I do know is there's like um, isotonic ones, there's ones that are more concentrated and less, and there's also like colloids and crystalloids, depending on the composition of the fluid itself. Um, I guess some of them are for fluid replacement, some are for like like fluid expansion, I think I've heard. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a few sort of <laughs> words I've heard. <laughs> so you've highlighted on a few of the points that I want to talk throughout the talk. And um, when you mentioned fluid replacement, that was one thing that I, was, that I was going to talk about specifically. So I'll go on to tell you how I sort of separate it to give you a little bit more of a framework. So the way that I think about fluids, I divide them into maintenance fluids, which is the fluids that we give uh, to address someone's normal daily requirements when they're healthy. Replacement fluids, which is the fluids we give to address any ongoing losses that someone is expected um, to have. And this may be in the context of pathology. So if they're sick, if they're vomiting, if they have diarrhea, that's any excess losses. And then resuscitation fluids are the fluids that you give to a hypovolemic patient in order to gain hemodynamic stability, right? To make them stable. And that takes the form of boluses. So IV fluid boluses of isotonic crystalloid. I'm going to stick to crystalloid for a large part of this talk because it simplifies and it's very much what you're going to be prescribing as an intern. So thinking about it in these three categories makes it a lot simpler for me to understand and calculate the fluids that I need to prescribe for each patient depending on the context. Does that make sense, Deborah? some hands uh, perfect all right 
So to best understand um, how we prescribe fluids, we need to know how fluid distributes within the body. About 60% of our total body water is made up of weight. Does anyone want to know how that is distributed um, in a healthy human? And I'll take a volunteer. And again, it doesn't matter if you get it right or wrong. Um, We'll go through the answer. Two-thirds intracellular and a third extracellular. And then a three-quarters of that extracellular is interstitial and then the rest is intravenous. That's actually perfect. So that's exactly what I was going to go on to describe. So one-third is extracellular, like you mentioned, and two-thirds is intracellular. And then the intravascular volume, which is the volume of blood or plasma that's within the blood vessels, that's about one-third of our extracellular volume, okay? And in a 70-kilogram person, that's five liters. So essentially, when we give IV fluids, we're filling up this intravascular component. Can everyone see my mouse there? Perfect. And we're filling up that intravascular component. And then via osmosis and other mechanisms, fluid will then shift into the other compartments. And here's a little diagram sort of demonstrating the different compartments um, in which fluid distributes. Now, I want someone to talk me through how they'd conduct a fluid assessment, and then we'll go through it step by step. It can be very basic, even if it's just the key points. I will go with Noor Ibrahim. Hi. Um, just on general inspection, you could um, look at things like mucous membranes. You can look at the capillary refill, so those sorts of things that you could just examine if there's any fluid balance charts on the bedside. Um, any sort of weights, um, I don't know. That's all I can think of. You actually, you actually um, hit some key points there for the examination. But let's take a step back. What do you need before you conduct your exam? Um, you can begin with general observations and looking at the patient's um, vital signs, the signs of hypertension and tachycardia. Awesome, yeah. Is there anything else you want to do with the patient, maybe before or while you're examining them? I know this probably isn't the answer to that question, but I just remember from PEDS that weighing the patient um, to like see the difference in weight can be helpful. Yeah, definitely. And I'm going to talk about the particular subset you think of in there. So I'll, I'll jump to what I'm talking about. You've all done a brilliant job at talking about the examination, but when something that's been drilled into you throughout medical school and doesn't change when you when you start working as a doctor is conducting a history, an examination, and investigations. So you start with your history, and for a fluid assessment history, it's very basic. The key points I think about is what's going in, what's going out, and then the symptoms or severity of that dehydration. And just knowing intake, output, severity allows you to remember the the questions in between. So in terms of intake, what are they eating and drinking? In terms of output, what's going out? Did they have diarrhea? Did they have vomiting? Did they have polyuria? Are there any medications that are going to increase output like diuretics? And then symptoms and severity wise, you can simply ask the patient if they're thirsty. The body's really good at detecting when it needs water. And if that's gone too far, you're going to start to get lightheadedness, palpitations, reduced urine output. So these are things you can ask about to determine how quickly you want to give your fluids. Now, you all did a great job at talking about the examination, so I'll keep it brief. Um, in terms of the exam, general inspection, of course, if a patient's sitting in a puddle of their own sweat, you know the output's quite large. Likewise, if they've got a whole heap of empty water bottles nearby, you know that they're drinking lots of water because they're thirsty. I do the vital signs, and there's two particular vital signs I'm most interested in in a patient that might be fluid depleted, uh, what might those be? Maybe blood pressure and heart rate. Perfect. And what would you expect in someone who's dehydrated? Would expect a lower blood pressure, maybe a higher heart rate to compensate. That's it. Heart rate will compensate first. And when that's not doing enough, the blood pressure is going to start to drop. That's your key sign to look at. And GCS is also another one in your elderly patient. The brain, just like any other organ, needs to be perfused. And when it's not perfused, it doesn't work properly. So the GCS might drop. 
In terms of other things, checking the peripheries, checking the cap refill, all great signs. The mucous membranes is a soft sign. However, it helps paint a clinical picture when you look at the rest of the examination as well. In terms of auscultating the lungs, looking at the JVP and looking at the lower limbs for edema, what do you think we're getting at? Like, What sort of patient population are we thinking about and what are we trying to rule in or rule out? Heart failure. Exactly. And what are you going to see in someone who's heart fail- who has heart failure? They tend to be fluid overloaded. Yeah. And what might you see in someone who's decompensated from heart failure in terms of their observations? So you'd see a bounding JVP, you'd see peripheral edema, maybe hepatomegaly. Nice. And what about their observations? What's going to happen to their heart rate and blood pressure? I guess their heart rate might may go up and blood pressure may go down. Exactly, but they're not they're not dehydrated, right? Giving yeah. them more fluids is not going to solve that issue. So it's important you do these tests in a patient that does have comorbidities like that, because you want to rule out fluid overload. Because in that instance, furosemide is the answer, not giving them more fluid. So you've got to be very cautious. Other things to look at are you. Other things to look at are your investigations, like your bloods, checking the HB, your UECs and CMPs, looking at electrolytes as well as urine function. Gives you an idea of whether the patient's slowly developing an AKI and any electrolyte imbalances you might look to address with your IV fluids. Lactate's a marker of end organ perfusion and if it's risen and you give fluids and it gets better, you know that was the cause. Dehydration was likely the cause of your, of your raised lactate. Chest X-ray again. That's in those. That's in those patients who you know are prone to APO, like your heart failure patients. Transthoracic echo is going to be good for look, looking at a collapsible IVC, but that is well beyond the realms of this talk. I don't think any of us will be um, doing TTEs on the ward. Central venous pressure is something you can look at in in the ICU setting and learn more about it. Just having a quick read, it just looks at the end diastolic volume and pressures in the heart. And then pulse pressure variation is essentially uh, looking at how the systolic blood pressure might change during the respiratory cycle. And again, beyond the means of this talk, but something to look at if you ever have an ICU rotation. Now, other things you look at is the trends over time. So, you know, is, the, is this an acute issue or a chronic issue? The fluid balance chart, take it with a grain of salt in the general medical ward because, you know, there might not be an IDC in situ. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to to measure urine output and intake when um, a patient isn't, you know, being looked after 24-7 by the same nurse. And then weight, and that's important. Your heart failure patients, your kidney failure patients, and your children. And the reason why is because they don't, they don't essentially compensate as well as um, healthy adults in terms of any imbalances in fluid. So the weight will go up and that means they're usually overloaded. The weight might go down, it usually means they're dehydrated. Now I want to go on and start talking about you know, maintenance, replacement, and resuscitation fluids. So to best understand, to best understand maintenance fluids, we need to know what normally goes into uh, what normally goes into a, a patient and what their normal requirements are. Does anyone have any idea of how much water we might de- need over the course of 24 hours? Yeah, I think I'll go with Jenny Shi. Uh, I think it's about 30 milliliters per kilogram per day. Yeah. And what does that equate to over the course of the day? Probably around two to three liters for regular. Two to three liters, exactly. Can you just simplify it, right? It's pretty basic stuff. So the number of per kilogram per hour is about 1.5 mils per kilogram per hour. And then the electrolytes, they're pretty difficult to estimate. You need your main extracellular ion sodium, you need one to two millimoles per kilo per day. Potassium, you need 0.5 to one millimole per kilo per day, and that's your main intracellular ion. And then glucose, you need 50 to 100 to prevent starvation, ketosis. But like I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go ahead and remember all of these figures. What I would remember is that you know anyone needs between two to three liters of fluid per day, depending on their weight. If they weigh 50 kilos, you give two liters. If they weigh, you know, 90 or 100 kilos, you might give three liters. 
In terms of sodium, potassium, and glucose, there's one common number across all of these variables um, that you need to remember, and that's the number one. So if you remember one of sodium, one of potassium, one of glucose per kilogram per day, you'll know the patient's normal daily requirements. So it's real easy from there on. But when we look at our IV fluid bags on the ward, you look at sodium chloride, it has 154 millimoles of sodium. Now, that's essentially more than a person needs over the course of a whole day. But it only has a liter of fluid. Hartman's is a bit better, has less sodium, some potassium in there as well. It's very similar. It's pretty much a very physiological fluid. Dextrose is dextrose and nothing else. Dextrose saline is a bit of sodium, a bit of glucose, but nothing else. So, you know, giving any one of these bags isn't going to fulfill these requirements here. So what we do to satisfy the nice guidelines that I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about is you can mix and match and you can also add potassium to bags, okay? But that's not always the case in our hospitalized patients and I'm going to tell you why. Now, I'm going to go through a maintenance fluids case. If someone, does someone want to volunteer early or otherwise I can just ask after we go through the case? All right, I might just pick someone after we go through it. Okay, so you're, you're the junior doctor. You've got a 27-year-old patient, 70 kilos. They've got belly recolic. They've had five similar episodes in the past. Surgeons have decided they're going to do a lap collie for this patient. And you notice they're hemodynamically well. They've been resuscitated. They don't need any more replacement fluid, the resuscitation fluids. And then you, um, and then you realize that the nausea, the nausea and vomiting is sort of resolved, but they're still not really able to eat anything as well as being fasting. What sort of fluids are you going to give this patient while they're awaiting theater? Saad, I might pick you to answer this one and we'll talk through it together. Sure. Um, just given that they're fasting, normally we'd probably put them on some IV fluids. Yeah, perfect. Um, I think from like my experience, like they normally put them on hardened um, or saline. Probably I'll just put them on heart and say 1,000, like a litre uh, over eight hours. One liter of it over eight hours. Probably. Excellent. Yeah. So what would that give you over? This is a 70 kilogram person. So I'd go about maybe two and a half liters. So maybe, you know, a 10 liter bag, a 10 liter bag, and maybe like a four hour, you know, half a bag over four hours. So that's exactly right. I give Hartman's. Why do you choose Hartman's specifically? Um, I guess because it reflects the normal plasma. Um, and uh, like sodium chloride has high risk of perhaps overloading them um, because it's got so much um, sodium. Um, more so, yeah, the sodium too, but also the chloride can lead to an acidosis. But we won't go in, we won't dwell on that too much. But you've actually picked the right answer. That's exactly what I would do as well. If you look at the NICE guidelines, they actually recommend doing something along this for maintenance fluids, but that's not keeping that's not keeping into consideration the fact that this is a surgical patient. They've got the stress of surgery and biliary colic that's going to raise their cortisol levels and bring their glucose up. So I wouldn't prescribe any glucose in the meantime. Um, surgery itself causes cell lysis and will result in the potassium rising. So I don't want to give them a potassium load pre-op because I don't want to lead to any hyperkalemia down the track. And of course, there's third, there's third spacing during surgery. So you want a fluid that is physiological, has the same osmolarity as blood to ensure it stays in that intravascular compartment for longer. It's essentially a load predicting that they might lose some fluids during their surgery. And that's the perfect answer. Good work, Sad. So the important points to take from this is just consider the context surgical versus medical. Know the underlying stress. Know that your maintenance fluids do, do differ depending on the patient, patient's comorbidities, heart failure patient on the 1.5 litre fluid restriction. You're not going to give them two and a half litres based off their weight. You're going to hold off. Every hospital has different IV bags to so get familiar with them. And overall, ask your boss uh, for, their, for their advice. And I wouldn't just ask them straight up. What I would do is I think about what I would give to do some of that critical thinking and then get their opinion on whether you think they think it's, whether they think it's, um, it's, good, 
it's an appropriate fluid to chart. And IV fluids do have adverse effects. And a lot of that comes from the fact that when you give a fluid intravenously, you're bypassing the gastrointestinal tract. And that's a major buffer for electrolytes and fluids. All right. So by giving things straight into the blood, you risk causing imbalances and overload as well as other issues. So make sure that if you're giving IV fluids daily, that you monitor daily UECs. Now onto replacement fluids. So replacement fluids is a couple of considerations I keep in mind. So I think about what the patient's lost in the previous 24 hours, what their pre-existing fluid deficit was. And sometimes this is replaced with a bolus. And then I'm like, okay, that ongoing loss, what caused it? And is it likely to continue in the next 24 hours? If that loss is likely to continue in the next 24 hours, I need to prescribe a fluid that is going to address it. Okay, so this is any additional loss on top of your normal losses. You want to make sure the electrolyte content of that fluid is similar to the electrolyte content of the fluid that's lost. The patient's losing blood, you give blood, but you have a strict target or trigger for that. So overall, giving fluids in this setting is you prescribe your maintenance and then you're like, all right, what loss is ongoing that's extra to their normal loss? And that's your replacement fluids. To understand that, you need to know what goes in and what goes out. And what you'll notice is that two and a half liters tend to go in um, through eating and drinking. And then out, you've got urine, respiration, sweating, feces. And these are estimates. If you've got a patient that's losing three liters of urine and everything else stays the same, how much replacement fluids do you think the patient's going to need? So three liters of urine, everything else stays identical. What would be the replacement volume? Do we have a volunteer? All right, I will go with uh, Mon. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess because the difference between three and one point five is one point five, I guess it would be an extra one point five on top of what you're already exactly. considering. That is exactly what you're going to prescribe: an extra one point five liters of fluid. That's your replacement fluid, and then you prescribe maintenance fluid to address the intake they're not getting. Perfect. All right, let's go through a case now. So you've got a replacement fluid case, 67-year-old female. She's in ED for 24 hours with significantly increased stomal output in the background of a previous Hartman's procedure for perforated diverticulitis. She's been appropriately resussed and her vital signs are all normal. And she's been unable to eat or drink, okay? She's had about a liter, through a, a liter of watery diarrhea through a stoma bag and no blood. And that's in addition to her normal losses. Pathology shows a white cell count of 16, a CRP of 300. The CT abdo pelvis is consistent with infective colitis. This isn't something that's going to resolve over 24 hours. What sort of fluids are you going to prescribe? I'll take someone to have a guess at that, and then we'll go ahead and talk through the scenario as well. And if anyone has any questions along the way, just feel free to ask. Let's go with Matt Taylor. Hey there. Sorry, I'm just cooking dinner at the moment, so I've been a little bit distracted. Um, yeah. But just some of my initial thoughts are so with the watery diarrhea, um, you'd be losing, I don't think, chloride quite a lot. Um, oh, I don't want you to think too much about the electron oh. that they're losing. How much fluid, what sort of fluids are you going to prescribe? So in terms of, um, you know, what volume of replacement fluids? Um, I mean, maybe just another add another liter of replacement fluids because exactly. she's lost a liter of, through diarrhea. That's it. Nice and easy. So you give maintenance fluids, and then you give a liter of extra fluid to address the diarrhea. Now, the reason why I didn't let you go ahead with talking about the electrolyte content on um, of the diarrhea is because. The NICE guidelines have actually published an excellent diagram that shows the electrolyte contents of the losses that patients might be experiencing. So in terms of stomal losses, you'll notice that they're very similar to um, Hartman's fluids. So prescribing an extra liter of Hartman's fluids in this context would be ideal and you'd address, you'd address their replacement fluids. Now going on to resource fluids. 
Uh, another case, and we'll go we'll go through it step by step. You've got a 28 year old male in ED. They're a trauma patient. They've been they've been assaulted and have a large stab wound to the neck. Uh, they don't have any other injuries. The primary trauma survey is complete. And the wounds part. Surgeons are preparing for the exploration of the patient's neck and theatre. The tachycardic at 135. Respirates 32. Blood pressure is 95. Sats are normal and the afebrile. They need to be resuscitated, but they're not going to get blood for another 45 minutes. What are you going to give this patient in the meantime? Let's go with Chris. Um, yep. So since he is hypotensive and he's tachycardic, uh, I guess maybe you could give like an, a stat like IV bolus of like normal saline. Yep. And then what would you do after that? Sorry, I'm not sure. Right. You're actually, your initial answer was right, so good work. What I'd do is essentially that, give them a stat bolus. I'd give Hartman's in the first instance, okay? Stat bolus of Hartman's, 500 mils of isotonic crystalloid, has the same osmolarity as blood. It's going to keep the intravascular space, you know, nice and full before it starts to redistribute. It will happen a lot slower than giving any other fluid. And after that, what I'll do is actually reassess the hemodynamics. And if they've improved, but they're not quite right, I'm going to give them another 500 and another 500. And I'm going to be looking at the hemodynamics and also looking for any signs of fluid overload. Okay? So that's the way I'd conduct this one. And usually you get to the point, once you've given two liters, you need to look to, you need to speak to someone more senior, whether it's ICU or one of your consultants or registrars about what to do next, just in case you're missing the diagnosis here. And looking at the advanced trauma life support classification of hemorrhagic shock, um, you can actually see that if the patient lost about, if their heart rate was 135, the rest rate was 32 and the blood pressure is reduced, it's probably a class three shock. They've lost between 1,500 to two liters of blood. So giving IV fluids and giving about one and a half to two liters of it in 500 mil boluses, because you can always give more, but you can't take back, is the appropriate response here. So good work. So always check for those signs of overload. And what I want to note as well is what you'll notice with resuscitation with this, with this um, classification of shock, the human body can actually lose quite a large volume of blood before the vital signs are completely off and can, you know, can maintain life up to some point. Um, yeah, after, even, even after 40% of blood loss. So the human body is quite robust, all right? But even when there's no change in vital signs, there's a, change, there's a chance that patients still lost quite a bit of blood. So, you know, less than 15%. So just keep this one in mind. The good work, resuscitation fluids, isotonic crystalloids. You're going to give 500 mil boluses, reassess, and another 500, reassess, and another 500, and take it from there. Now, we mentioned blood earlier, and I mentioned that giving more blood isn't always necessarily the key. And this has all come from the TRIC trial, which was a large multi-center randomized control trial in patients with critical illness. And these were patients who expect to stay in ICU for over 24 hours. And what they did is they trialed the restrictive transfusion protocol versus a liberal transfusion protocol, where in the restrictive, the transfusion trigger was a HB of less than 70. And in the liberal protocol, it was, a, it was a HB of less than 100. And what they found in the primary outcome was that there was no change in the rate of death at 30 days. No difference between the two groups. So more blood wasn't necessarily better. And in the secondary outcome, what they actually found was that mortality rates during hospitalization were actually lower in the restrictive group. So that's something to keep note of. Um, what they found is actually you know, only giving blood when it's absolutely required leads to better outcomes overall. So that's why we, we have that transfusion trigger of 70. Now, the exception of this is our cardiac patients that have a sick heart. They need a few more red blood cells to get the oxygen there, and they may have higher oxygen requirements. Now, yeah, like I said, the trick trial pretty much support the fact that we shouldn't transfuse unless the HB was under 70. And in the patients that they had, they were all uvolemic. So they would have undergone fluid resuscitation first. 
And then they would have had a HB measured. And if it was under 70, they got blood. And the reason why I want to bring this up is because when you think about red blood cells, you know, they're parked, they're filtered, they go through all these processes, they're in and out of fridges and transported. So, you know, pack red blood cells aren't necessarily as good as your own blood. And giving pack red blood cells leads to ABO compatibilities, transfu other transfusion reactions, overload, infection. So you should only give it when it's absolutely required. Does that make sense to everyone? Any questions from there? No worries. All right, I'll move on to the next slides. So yeah, one and a half to two liters of crystalloid would be the answer in the last case. All right, so I've actually taken my, my talk is very much based on the NICE guidelines, which is a UK guideline where they, they pretty much made a, an algorithm for prescribing fluids in UK hospitals. And it's highly applicable to, to our hospitals here. And it's very useful to use it in turn. I suggest you look it up. So the way they start is you do your initial assessment of your patient, A to E assessment. If they're hemodynamically unwell, very obviously hypovolemic, you're going to give fluid resuscitation. So going to this step here. And in that case, you're going to do what we talked about, 500 mil bolus of crystalloid, reassess the OBS, and if the OBS is still abnormal, give another 500. And you do that until you reach two liters. And then you're speaking to someone more senior just in case there's something else going on. If the patient doesn't appear very obviously hypovolemic or shocked, you're then just going to look at the overall fluid and electrolyte needs. So go through your history, examination, and investigations. Then you need to ask yourself, can this patient get their fluids enterally or orally? That's the most physiological way to get fluids. And it leads to the to the least issues down the track, has the least complications. It's what we do at home. It's what we should be aiming for for our patients. We aim for normality. If they can't get any of their fluids orally or enterally, you need to ask yourself, are there any complex fluid um, issues? So issues with distribution or any ongoing losses like nausea, like diarrhea, vomiting, polyuria, et cetera. And if the answer is no, you just give routine maintenance fluids which is essentially trying to address those numbers I talked about. So fluid requirement, sodium requirement, potassium requirement, and glucose requirement. Now, in the case where they do have some ongoing losses that aren't exactly normal, you're going to give replacement fluid on top of the normal maintenance fluid. And you're going to use that diagram we spoke about to be able to do that. So some golden rules to remember when you're prescribing IV fluids is that postoperatively, potassium can increase due to cell lysis. Okay, so cells break down during surgery, potassium is released, and the potassium levels in the blood can rise. So giving patients potassium in this setting can lead to complications like hypokalemia. In heart failure, these patients are very much prone to pulmonary, pulmonary overload or edema. So if you're giving resuscitation fluids, be cautious. Uh, I'd start with 250 mil boluses. And then if I'm giving them their ongoing fluid replaces, replacement IV, I would go by their restriction. So they're on a 1.5 liter fluid restriction. That's, what I'm, that's my target. In stroke, you want to avoid hyperglycemia and aim for normoglycemia. So don't give these patients any fluids with glucose because you could worsen their outcomes from the stroke. Unless, of course, they're hypoglycemic. That's the exception. Kidney disease, sick kidneys, chronic kidney disease, they don't, those kidneys don't do a great job at eliminating potassium. So be very cautious with what you prescribe in terms of potassium because it can accumulate and lead to arrhythmias down the track. Children, like we discussed, have very specific needs. There's the 4 2 1 rule, which I might make a lecture about a little bit later. Uh, but ideally, check the RCH guidelines because they have a, a very well-structured protocol for administering fluids. And if you're giving daily IV fluids, you do daily UECs. And like I said, this has a lot to do with the fact that we bypass the gastrointestinal tract. And therefore, by giving bloods intravenously, we need to make sure that the electrolytes aren't going completely out of whack because we're 
missed out on a few homeostatic mechanisms. And if the patient can eat and drink, they don't need IV fluids. And you need to assess this on a basic, on a, on a regular basis. I know when I was working in ICU, the ICU consultants and all the rest of the staff were always aiming for normality. You're trying to get a patient eating as early as possible and drinking as early as possible because that's going to lead to the best outcomes and that's going to facilitate a, a more safe discharge. And one of the things you really need to remember is potassium should not be given at a rate of more than 10 millimoles per hour because it, you risk putting the patient into cardiac arrest. And as we know, we, with patients, we do no harm. So avoid that. Now, I want to go on to some advanced cases before we go on to some questions. Um, so listen closely. I'm going to pick someone from the audience again. So you've got a heart failure patient, they're tachycardic, and they're hypotensive. What may this mean? Any takers? We'll go with Carol Wu. Um, could I give it a shot? Yep. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking through my screen. What's your name? Um, could it mean, so out of many, could it be like it's gotten decompensated? Or this could be like pericarditis or cardiac tamponade or that's all I've yeah. got. Yeah, so you've actually gone beyond the box. So very good. What I what I what I what I'd say is is this patient overloaded and decompensated, or is this a patient um, who is overloaded, okay, and hypovolemic, and it could be one or the other. Do you want to take a crack at guessing? I mean, not guessing, but talking through how you differentiate between someone that's overloaded or underloaded in this setting. Um. Actually, not sure, but to start it off, would I look at blood pressure and then is low blood pressure? Does it, I'm thinking that means low volume. Yeah, but like we said earlier, like you mentioned, it can mean too much volume if the heart's decompensated. You think about the heart, the sure. heart yeah, yeah. Or, mm. um, in heart failure, you've sort of gone beyond that optimal. Um, you know, that optimal length at which the cardiomyocytes contract. And when you get to that point, um, your heart isn't really efficient at pumping. So it tries to pump faster, but it's not enough to keep your blood pressure up. What sort of signs in the body would you look at to differentiate between overload or hypovolemia? Oh, like tissue turbo, skin. Sorry, like dryness versus... Just edema, everything's... That's it. That's where the money is. So the edema. So you're looking at the peripheries for any pitting edema. Um, in addition to that, you're also listening to the chest for any, um, for any bi-basal creps. Uh, looking at the JVP, they say it's a mythical sign, but in a truly uh, failing heart, or someone with really bad renal failure, you will see a JVP that goes well beyond the earlobes. And you'll know straight away that this patient's overloaded. So it can be a great sign to prove your diagnosis. So that's pretty much it. Um, again, you still do your history exam and investigations. The money here is in the chest. It's in the lower limbs. It's in the JVP. It might be in the mucous membranes. The weight, like I discussed earlier, is a really, really good marker as well. Heart failure patients need to get need to get weighed regularly um, because when they put on weight, it's usually overload and can lead to decompensated heart failure. Another advanced case, and I think I'm going to choose. Um, let's go with Randy Sin Sidhu. Randy Sidhu. All right, I'm going to ask you this, this case. So just have a listen. You've got a patient on a beta blocker for rapid AF. They've come in with a two-day history of pancreatitis and they're vomiting. Now, as a result of the pancreatitis, they can't eat or drink anything. They've got no appetite at all. What do you think their observations are going to look like? 
So it's a two-day history. So I'm assuming for those two days, um, they haven't really been eating or drinking and they have associated vomiting. So just general principles, if we think about output, um, uh, I would consider vomiting as potential fluid loss, but definitely there's a lack of input, uh, not eating or drinking. Um, and uh, so in terms of just like clinical assessment, I would uh, say that they probably wouldn't have a fluid deficit. Uh, so potentially hypotensive, uh, maybe tachycardic. Uh, yeah, things yeah. like that. So the tachycardia, right? This is an advanced level case. So uh, this is something, this will be a really good talking point. This is a patient who has a history of rapid AF and is now on a beta blocker. So for a heart to raise its heart rate, you know, the sympathetic nervous system gets stimulated, adrenaline, noradrenaline gets released, it binds to the beta-1 receptors of the heart and causes increased contractility and rate. In this instance, we've blocked that response. So what do you think the heart is going to do? Um, it may not be tachycardic, exactly, so it might not be able to uh, increase beats per minute. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's great. They actually won't be able to, to become tachycardic. They may lack that response. And as a result, the blood pressure might be lower than you'd normally expect. And the heart rate might be normal, but don't be fooled by a normal heart rate. Check the drugs, see what they're on previously, because that could mask any normal signs you'd look for. So we've spoken about what the what the observations look like. What do you need to do in this setting, though? Would you do anything different? The additional thing I'd have to consider is the beta blocker for this. Um, I'm not sure if we would consider if uh, we would be uh, stopping that for the moment, but I would definitely be considering in the meantime some IV fluids. Uh, so potentially uh, resuscitation fluid. Yeah, that's right. So um, in this instance, the that nausea and vomiting. So having really given you the, if their odds are abnormal, yes, you're going to give them resuscitation fluids. And the reason why I say, yeah, the resuscitation fluids is right. The beta blocker specifically, usually we tend to, to stop it. Because what we worry about is if the patient can't compensate, they will continue to decompensate. And then that will lead to end, other end organ problems. If you're not perfusing the kidneys, you're not perfusing the brain, you're not perfusing the liver or the heart, you're going to end up with multi-organ failure. So we stop these to sort of keep the blood pressure a bit higher and give them resuscitation fluids. Um, yeah, keep we, we've just got a question in the chat from Long. He was just saying, um, would he not be able to take this beta blocker over the last couple of days? Um, so would it be out of his system by the time of presentation? So if he, so in this, in this scenario, I'm saying that the patient's on a beta blocker um, while they've had pancreatitis. But if we've stopped it beforehand, yes, you're right. We should still see the rise in heart rate. But in this particular scenario, I'm talking about the beta blocker not having been stopped. They've got the two-day history. They've had excessive pain and issues at home, and they're presented to hospital um, still on that beta blocker. Any other questions about that one? Nick, just on that one, so um, for pancreatitis, I know that they normally eat through a lot of fluid, so they require quite a bit of fluid. Um, do you just... For maintenance-wise, do you just stay on the two to three liters or do you give more? Uh, so there's actually a protocol for addressing uh, uh, addressing the fluid requirements of pancreatitis patients. And the surgeons follow that very, very well. Um, but yeah, it is a it is a resuscitation fluid regime that you continue depending on the trajectory of the pancreatitis. Okay, and if someone was, Ruth, I might just get you one to look it up because I actually forgot the name of that. Um, so just to make sure I don't get that incorrect. But yeah, there is a protocol you follow, but essentially it's resuscitation fluids. And it's not only resuscitation fluids from a reduced intake perspective, 
It's a resuscitation fluids due to the third space shifting that occur with pancreatitis because it's an inflammatory response. You're prone to SIRS. You vasodilate. You get these leaky vessels um, as a result of a rate of an increase in the, in the, um, in the immune system. And, you know, fluid just comes out of the intravascular space and into the other compartments. So, yeah, you're right. It's a resuscitation fluid regime that you follow. All right. Now, let's open it up for any other questions that people might have. And uh, thanks for doing such a great job today, today guys. I hope that, uh, you know, I hope that simplifies things for you. So whenever you're in the hospital, I want you to think about maintenance fluids being what someone needs day to day under normal conditions, replacement fluids being what we need to provide to address any ongoing losses that are predicted, and then resuscitation fluids, hypovolemic patient, it's hemodynamically unwell, it's the boluses we're giving to make them hemodynamically stable and reach euvolemia. Nick, um, thank you so much for the lecture the It was really useful. I've just got a bit of a side question. It's not actually relevant to fluids, sorry, but I'm just interested in the pathophys behind why is hyperglycemia like so bad in a stroke? What does the glucose do? Yeah, so there's been actually quite a large number of studies on on the um, the outcomes of stroke patients um, in regards to their to their um, blood glucose levels, and what they've found is when the sugars are a bit above, I think it's six to twelve to be specifically um, in the acute phase. Uh, if you're outside of those ranges, the outcomes are worse. Don't know the exact reason why the why the um, why the outcomes are worse, but that's a general rule and you hear about it throughout the hospital. Um, so it's something, it's a mistake you don't want to make. Uh, so whenever you've got a patient that you're looking after on a night shift or during the day that's had a recent stroke, you're aiming for normal glycemia. And it's the same thing for many other pathologies as well. You're always aiming for normal glycemia. I know even in anesthetics, you know, our sicker patients, we we always try to make sure that they're not, they're not hypoglycemic. Um, I guess having high blood sugars increases your risk of infection, um, makes tissue tissue um, healing poorer. So there's a whole heap of reasons associated with that. Thanks, Freya. Good question. No, thank you. Um, I'm sure it's very complicated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a bit more to it, but if you actually look it up on our Google Scholar, you'll probably find some of the more recent articles and say that say why that why that is the case. But there's a definite association there. Yeah, I just did a quick Google and I found like a really good um, PubMed page that sort of explains it all. So I'll give that a read. <laughs> Great. I actually had a question as well, Nick. I'm thinking about when I prescribe fluids. And I usually just go for Hartman's unless I'm worried about potassium, like they've got hyperkalemia or renal issues. Is there any other instances that you can think when you would prefer normal saline? Yeah, normal saline. Usually the time that I prescribe normal saline has been someone I'm really worried about their potassium level. And in that instance, even five millimoles is something that turns me off of that. Um, so I just give them... Yeah, normal saline. But overall, out of the two isotonic crystalloid fluids, I always prescribe Hartman's. And those combinations I showed you regarding the, the um, NICE guidelines, that's something that in the medical setting of the particular circumstances does get prescribed. I mean, you have all these, um, I guess, a combination of comorbidities that would lend them um, unable to eat or drink but, you know, still requiring some sort of nutrition and electrolyte. So that's when I start mixing and matching the bags a little bit. But overall, as a general rule, you just stick for Hartman's. There's a um, question in the chat as well from Emma um, and another one from Chris. Can you, can you see those ones? Hi, Nick. Thanks so much. Just wondering at what point would you consider giving dextrose when a patient's fasted? So patient's hypoglycemic. All right, so they're usually on diabetic meds. 
and you notice the sugars start to drop, I give dextrose. The other, the other context where I do give dextrose as well is a patient that's on a flozen and ha- is now fasting. Now, does anyone know what flozens are? Yep, so the flozens, lovely. So they're a class of antihypoglycemics, right? And one of the side effects, one of the potential side effects is euglycemic ketoid acidosis. And I've seen people admitted to ICU with this issue. So generally, whenever I'm looking after a patient that has come in acutely unwell, needing surgery, for me, I, I just came off a gastroenterology rotation. And generally, it's someone with an upper GI bleed. Um, what I did make sure is I gave them, I gave them 5% dextrose in the background to ensure that I'm giving them a constant supply of glucose. So they don't go into you by semi acidosis and a small dose of insulin in the background as well. So that's usually the, the context where I, where I give dextrose in a fasted patient. So check the ketones. If the ketones are rising, dextrose that can also be a, um, yeah, grateful to prescribe, get those ketones to go down. And I always consult with, with endocrinology when I do that. And in addition to that, what I also do is I make sure that I take a VBG to check to see if they're acidotic. So before you make an endocrinology phone call as an intern or as an HMO, I want you to, you know, look at the sugars, look at the ketones, um, you know, have a think about what you might do. Maybe give them a fluid bolus first, then maybe move on to some dextrose, but then give your, your endocrinology reg or team a call. Um, with a VBG result, with a ketones result, just to make sure the patient isn't ketoacidotic. Any other? Oh, I've got another question in the chat. So, Chris, with the last case, would you just completely stop his medication? Would you switch him over to a rhythm control like amiodarone? Would you still inhibit his inability to compensate for the hypertension? So, generally, depending on the extent of the rapid AF, I usually just stop the beta blocker completely. And if they do happen to go into rapid AF, we may restart it at a lower dose or consult with cardiology and try to make try to make a um, um I guess uh, make a decision that lays in between the best interest of the patient's fluid status and end organ perfusion as well as their heart. Because if the heart's also beating too fast, they're not getting end diastolic volume, which means the cardiac output uh, can likely reduce from that as well. So it's a fine balance, and usually it's a multidisciplinary team discussion. And by that, I mean your team and the cardiology team. Okay, we might need to finish up there. I can just see it's getting away from us. Um, any other questions, though, feel free. How can people get I'll questions? I'll type my email into the chat, and I'm very happy to have people email me directly if they have any questions about um, fluid balance. And everyone, we'll just go on to the next screen if you want to just have a look at the. Oh, wait, no, let me just pop that there. 92. Um, everyone meeting, lovely. I've just posted my email into the chat. And everyone, if you have any questions, just email me. And please um, send some feedback on the next page to just take a quick photo of that. And we'll go from there. I'm going to log off very shortly. I'll give you a minute to give some feedback. We like learning from feedback, it helps us judge what we're going to do over the next shoots. So I really appreciate it. Be as honest as possible. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nick. And yeah, everyone can take a photo of the QR code, do the survey. We'd really appreciate it um, so we can make these shoots better in the future. I forgot to say at the start, the session is recorded and we'll let you know on the Facebook page how to rewatch it. And yeah, awesome. make sure you've got ABC's anesthesia and listen out for the next shoot. Right. See you later, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well. 